Friends and residents and ministry learn what you have learned. I am obedient to the lectionary. You know that is true. And this week, it was a gift because I was able to preach on Thursday, and I'd already had my sermon written for Sunday. It's just easy for me to adopt uh, the lectionary as a busy uh, full-time seminarian as someone pastoring two churches that were an hour away plus seminary. It was just easy to go to the lectionary, but it's proven to be so relevant. So if you fast forward five years to today, we'll be five years in October, I remain obedient to the lectionary because my experience has taught me that the lectionary is so relevant as to what's going on in our lives today. And in our scripture for today, we see there is, once again, no exception. Verse 12, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is testing you. Does anyone else here out in the world that you feel like a match has been lit and a fire has been stoked as you go about your week, as you encounter people out and about, or perhaps the things that we're going through in this time? Yeah, that's, it's very relevant to me. Does anyone else here feel like sometimes your stuff is on fire, you're putting out fires all the time, there are fiery ordeals? going on in the world, and I'm guessing it's not just my household that feels these trials and tests that bring on stress and tension and anxiety that we seem to find ourselves in. And I think another part of verse 12 describes the climate that we're experiencing today as we're living out our call to be disciples of Christ for the transformation of the world. It says the fire ordeal is described as something that is strange that's taking place to test us. Something strange is going on, friends. And I continue to say it's not one strange thing, it's a bunch of strange things. Now, I don't know if I'm the one that coined this term. I try to give credit where credit's due, but I think I might have coined this one. I'm calling this the trifecta of cultures that we're living in. We're called to make disciples of Christ as we transform the world, as we labor under the cultures of post-Christendom. Post-Christian culture, friends, we've talked about it. Church not being the center of society. And we have post-COVID culture that we're laboring in. Some would say it's still not over, but I think by and large, most people think that we've hit a place where we're saying that it's over-ish. And then the last one really isn't post, but it's what's going on right now in our own spaces. So I'm calling that church schism culture. Folks are going different directions. And so I do think these are strange times indeed, where it's all coming together in this culture that we're laboring, laboring in, and tests abound in nearly every corner that we turn. But yet we're still here, friends. We're alive. We're here as sent disciples of Christ. Glory be to God. Now, Peter told the community what, friends? He said to rejoice in their suffering. That's not a word you often hear about as you talk about suffering. We don't usually equate the word rejoice. But he's telling them to rejoice. He said that one day they could even be glad and they would shout for joy when Christ's glory is revealed. Now this week I had the pleasure of doing some shouting of joy to folks who were a little bit farther in that process than me, kneeled down in front of the bishop and were anointed as new ordinance. They'll go on to be ordained. And I rejoice, with joy as we welcome in the new folks, my new friends of track one. And then track two was set, track three was set. So we did some rejoicing as we're all progressing. And we are blessed, friends. It says in the scripture, we're blessed because God's spirit rests on us. We are blessed. Now, as we continue on in the text, I read in a working preacher uh, that Peter is providing pastoral care as he tends to the souls of an afflicted community. And it was John Frederick, I believe, in a working preacher that said this statement. He said, the afflicted church is the authentic church. Let me say that again. The church that goes through some stuff that is afflicted is the authentic church. And then he goes on to say the afflicted church is not an abandoned church. And although we might go through some difficult times, friends, we are never alone. We are never abandoned. God's Spirit is with us as we work to bring peace, love, and justice to a hurting world as we live out our role as sent disciples. Yes, we'll experience strange things. There will be fiery ordeals along the way, but we are never abandoned. In fact, as we just read, it says we're blessed because the Holy Spirit is with us. We're not unscathed, friends. We don't make it out unscathed. We got a few scars and a few bruises. But we are blessed as we continue to listen to the voice, as we continue to follow the greatest teacher the world has ever known, as we continue to spread the peace, love, and mercy 
and grace of Jesus Christ. Friends, we are called to a time such as this. The work cannot stop. So that lives can be changed by the radical love and hospitality, mercy, and grace of Jesus. And as we live out this call, our main goal should be not our glory, but that Christ alone can be magnified. Christ alone. As we continue further in the scripture, Peter offers instructions on how this afflicted community should move forward. So now here's the list of things you should do. First thing he says is humble yourself. Therefore, humble yourselves so that the mighty hand of God, so you'll be under the mighty hand of God, so that God may exalt you in due time. So amidst all the fiery and strange things many of us experience, or that we might currently be experiencing, I don't know about you, friends, but humility may not be the first posture that comes to mind. Sometimes you gotta, you got to find your humility. If we're being honest with each other, we realize it's very difficult to have humility, it's difficult to be a good example in times when we're experiencing fiery ordeals and trials. However, that should always be our goal. It should always be our goal is humility. God can't be exalted in us if we are not humble during our trials and tribulations. And life produces what my former, my first conference superintendent, Beth Perry, would describe as EGR moments, extra grace required, friends. Sometimes you need to access some extra grace as the person standing in front of you, and you say, what comes out of my mouth next? It matters, friends. So EGR, extra grace required. And in those moments, we do very well to remind ourselves that Christ alone should be our goal, to reflect the light of Christ in all situations. What we say matters, friends. What we do matters. It must matter, and it does matter. Our words and our actions that either bring glory to God or they weaken the witness. So, friends, I encourage you to always shine the light of Christ so that Christ can be magnified. Easier said than done, I know. That's what we must be striving for. Now, Peter says another thing to the community. He says, you've got to be disciplined. As I pondered the text, I thought about the vital importance of our spiritual disciplines. And what would those be? It would be your prayer time, your devotional time, your Bible study, the time when you're just silent in front of God, asking for the Spirit to speak to you. It's very vital that we engage in our spiritual disciplines. And we are disciplined, if you will. Jennifer Kalin writes in The Working Preacher also, that discipline is the repeated action that is necessary to achieve positive results. So it's not a one and done, it's repeated action. We should be daily uh, striving to live out our spiritual disciplines. And it takes effort, and it takes focus. So friends, these instructions to be humble and to be disciplined, it speaks to what? The steadfastness of your faith when you're going through some stuff. Are you staying engaged in your disciplines? Are you listening for the Spirit? Are you walking closely with Jesus? We must be steadfast, friends, as we live out our calls. We must be steadfast in our disciplines as we work to make Christ glorified in all things. And friends, as I've said, it's rough out there. We will suffer in this life. But in this way, it says we're sharing in Christ's suffering. Probably not nearly as much as Christ, but we're sharing in it. And we are never alone. So hold on, steadfast in your faith with humility and discipline. Now as we move on to the scripture, you see a well-known and loved verse. Cast all of your anxieties on God because God cares for you. Frankly, friends, that could be its own sermon. But maybe that happens in track three. I can't preach on just one verse. Maybe I'll get there, right? It's a goal. It could be one whole sermon. But let's talk about anxiety for a minute. Now, friends, as I've told you, I'm a recovering pessimist. Might have even told you that my mom, when I was a teenager, bought me a little plaque and said, it said, I'd like to be an optimist, but I doubt if it would work out. You know what I'm saying? I was in my room as a teenager. I don't know about y'all, but does anyone else have worries and doubts? Anybody here have trouble coping with their anxiety? Anyone here have trouble accessing hope? So I'm going to tell you a story. might be familiar to you about coping and hope. As you know, Chris and I were foster parents. And at this time, we had six kids in the house, but one of them was a little girl about seven or eight years old. I can't say her name. But she had seen and experienced things that no child should ever see. 
in her life. And because of that, she had trauma. And many times she would act out uh, very, very uh, greatly and she would have breakdowns. And we were taught to tell her, little one, use your coping skills. And so one day she's in a crisis and I said to her, use your coping skills. To which her reply was, Ron, I'm trying, but I can't find my hoping skills. <laughs> and I don't think my little friend could possibly ever have known how much that would change the way that I viewed stress and anxiety. I can't find my hoping skills. And I thought as we're searching to cope, friends, our hope is in Jesus, in Christ alone. Our hope is in Jesus. We don't need a bunch of platitudes, a bunch of nice statements, a bunch of people saying, get over it, little buddy. We don't need that. They're well-intentioned, but it's not helpful. What we need is to go to the Lord in prayer. We need our hoping skills. We need to draw on the hope of Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. As we're present with folks, let us tell them, access your hope that is in Jesus. And as again, as I think about experience in my faith, and I'm asking you to think about the same thing, as you walk with Jesus, don't you come to the conclusion that Jesus is always with you? Always with us. Jesus has no doubt brought me through some, what I thought were impossible circumstances. If you think about your life, I think you would probably conclude the same thing. I'm sure that you would. And in these times when I'm going through some things, I recall the lyrics to one of my favorite hymns. Maybe you know it too. The lyrics that say, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for strength to trust him more. Oh, for strength to trust him more. Again, I think about my spiritual disciplines. Am I working on my disciplines? Am I remembering to take it to the Lord in prayer? Am I walking daily? Am I striving daily to take on just a little bit more of my hope in the world who is Jesus? So friends, my message this morning is use your hoping skills. Define and work on. Have discipline about your hoping skills. We will experience trials and anxiety, but take it to the Lord in prayer. And as we move on, let me tell you another story about my same little friend, same little child. As you can imagine, we had nine people in the household. There's Krishna and I, my mom, who was at the end of her life, and then there's six kids. Now, trying to get, get eight people out of the house, mom often stayed home. Trying to get six kids and Krishna and I out the door, that was a, a monumental task, friends. And here's Krishna shouting out the orders. Ron, you take that, put it in the van. Gene, don't forget to pack your medicine. Maddie, grab that bag and put it in the van. And all the kids had a job. The same little child looks at my mom. The oxygen machine is buzzing in the background, the tank. And she looks at my mom. And she said, Granny, your job is just to breathe. B-R-E-A-V-E. -E. Just breathe, Granny. I don't think she could know how much that day changed me. As I think about when I'm going through some anxiety, and I say, just breathe, Ronald, just breathe. And so I take a deep breath in, and then oftentimes I'll find another hoping skill in that. I take a deep breath, and then I let it out to God. Lament is a hoping skill, friends, a coping skill, if you will. God has big shoulders. God can take it. So sometimes after I breathe deep, a lament comes out, and it's okay. God can take it, friends. Lament early and often. These days when I'm stressed, I do tell myself, Breathe. Only I tend to sing another hymn in my head. Breathe on me, breath of God, as I breathe in and as I exhale, I say, it's going to be okay. Jesus is the light of the world. He's my hope. And my experience, again, is telling me that God has always been with me and will continue to be with me. So this morning I say, friends, just breathe. Use your hoping skills because Jesus lives another hymn. We can face all the tomorrows. As I begin to close, you know I'm going to close a couple times, right? But as I begin to close, let me focus back on the text where it says, Suffering will not last forever. God will, it says in the scripture, restore us, support us, strengthen us, and establish us. That's quite a list, friends. And all be glory to God. Because we can stand on those promises. I think that's our closing hymn. All glory to God. Just free, friends. There's going to be fiery ordeals, but we're going to be okay. And as I continue on in this closing, I'm reminded there's a whole lot of good going on right here. It's not all bad is what I'm saying. It's not all trials and ordeals. There's a whole lot of good as the Spirit breaks forth, as we are the hands and feet of Jesus in this community. 
I heard out in Exponential, out in Florida, I think it was Pastor Cho, that said the Holy Spirit is a mover, friends. It's moving powerfully here. It will continue to move powerfully among you. And as we, that's why I love the praise and prayer time, the glory sightings every week. It's a reminder to all of us that God shows up often. God sustains us all the days of our lives. Now, I've been privileged over the last couple weeks to listen to the new ministry ideas of, of fellow colleagues. Glory be to God. The Spirit is a mover, friends. Folks are figuring out new ways to do some things. Even among tests and trials, the Spirit is moving. So there's so much to shout for joy about today. But we are blessed because the Spirit of God is a mover and it's resting upon us. Glory to God, friends, for all of you. God is being glorified through the call God has placed on your life that you're living out in this difficult most difficult of times. It's rough out there. So as I do get to the closing, let's think about the times we're living in. Virus and tumultuous? Check. Strange? Check. Spirit of glory resting upon us? Check. Glory sightings that we reveal every week and reveal God's glory? Check. The Holy Spirit is moving, friends. And I thank God that it's moved all of you here for a time such as this. We're all called to a time such as this. Strange, but a crucial time. And there will be more fiery ordeals. I don't think this is, a, it is a unique stage, but I don't think it's the last thing we're going to deal with. Certainly not. But God is with us. And above all, God will be glorified. And as I really do close, remember, friends, you are prayed for. You are loved by the Most High God. Jesus loves you, and so do I. So just breathe, friends. Just breathe. Read on us, breath of God. God is with us, and the God who brought us here will see us through. Tough times don't last forever. Tough people do. <laughs> I think it's better said. Tough times don't last forever, but God's love and guidance do. That's a better way to state that. So just breathe, friends, and know that your hope is always in Jesus. If you can look up when you're down, friends, you can get up. And when you look up, it's the hope of Jesus that will allow you to get up all the days of your life. Peace and blessings to you all. Make me well with your soul. It is so. Amen. God bless you.